It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Leon Klempner, all the way from New York. He and Amy Epstein, MBA, are co-founders of People in Practice, a marketing consultancy that grows general dental and specialty practices in the U.S. and Canada. Dr. Klempner, CEO of People in Practice, is a board-certified orthodontist who practiced orthodontics for over 38 years. He graduated from dental school from the University of Maryland, which is the first dental school in the world, isn't it? That's right. Like 1840, was it? And received a certification in orthodontics from Tufts University. That's in Boston, right? Correct. Dr. Klemner is on the teaching faculty of two dental schools, and his work has been published in the Journal of Clinical Orthodontics and the American Journal of Orthodontics and Dentofacial Orthopedics, among others. Klemner has lectured both nationally and internationally on the subject of digital marketing. His co-founder is Amy Epstein, is a director of client services at People in Practice. Before launching the company, she spent 15 years as vice president and managing director of multinational marketing and branding firms. Epstein has an MBA in marketing from Baruch College and regularly lectures at the Zicklin School of Business and Long Island University School of Business on the subject of digital marketing, entrepreneurship, and social media. My, my first question to you is, um, there's a lot of orthodontists on Orthotown and a lot of orthodontists on uh, Dentaltown. They, they talk to orthodontists when they just want to keep it between themselves because you can't get on Orthotown unless you're an orthodontist. But a lot of them are claiming that um, it's a lot more orthodontics for an orthodontist, that it's a lot more competitive today than it was uh, 30 years ago when I got out of school. Do you, do you think that's true? Oh, uh, no, it's no question about it. I mean, they, you know, the whole landscape of the not only the orthodontic profession, but the whole dental profession has changed so rapidly um, and the competition is particularly for orthodontists, is really ramped up. You know, when I, when I first started in practice, my I was a big early treatment guy, okay? So most of my competitors weren't involved, didn't have any interest in early treatment. They'd wait until all the teeth came in, and then they would try to kind of fix things. But I was always into early treatment. And uh, my primary referrers were pediatric dentists. So, uh, and we had tons of them around and, and, and they kept me busy. And then little by little by little, you know, all the pedo guys brought orthodontists into their practice. That began to dry up. And then general dentists, which are the mainstay of, of orthodontic referrals, um, began to lose some of their referring power. You know, uh, patients became more empowered with the internet. Insurance companies began to dictate where they could send people. So um, it's gotten a lot more competitive. Plus, you know, there's tons of ortho guys coming out that are having a hard time finding jobs and have hundreds, five, six, sometimes $700,000 in debt. That is just crazy. So um, I, I'm, you went to um, Maryland, which was the first dental school. And so I just thought I would add, since you're an orthodontist, that it was Edward H. Engel who started the first school of orthodontics in 1901 and created a simple classification for crooked teeth in the late 1800s, a system still in use today. What, what, what are your thoughts of uh, Edward Engel? You know, he, he, I, I, my, my thoughts are that, you know, the Engel classification uh, is something that's taught in every school. Um, it has some relevance, um, but... You know, that was in 1900 or, or whatever. I mean, a lot of, a lot of things have changed and, and, you know, facial aesthetics, early treatment, growth and development. Um, there's a lot of factors that have shifted from just looking at a molar relationship in terms of determining the quality of the orthodontic care to a much more global perspective, at least for the forward-minding orthodontist, that's the case. But it's pretty profound that he started the first school of orthodontics i mean he basically started the specialty didn't he it was and then it was the first specialty yeah yeah oh orthodontics was the first yeah. specialty yeah very first yeah huh interesting yeah so um do you think that uh um since you and i got out of school the biggest brand in all of dentistry i mean when you and i got out of school you already had colgate crest and listerine all that but invisalign is probably the biggest brand in the in our space created in our careers. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it seems like every orthodontist I talk to tells me that it's about 20% of their practice. Well, what, are, what are your thoughts on this um, game-changing technology? 
Well, you know, I, 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 I'm a early adopter. I, I'm a techie and early adopter. I, I probably was uh, one of the first in the country to go completely uh, digital with my treatment notes in uh, 1992, I think. So um, I was in the first Invisalign training program at the Marriott Hotel in New York City. It was specialist only. What year and, was that? Uh, that was 99, maybe 98. Not, not, wow. not quite sure. And they started with just, uh, you had to be a specialist to go to their class yeah. in the beginning? Absolutely. Just like Brandmark, when he brought implants out, he only would teach it to oral surgeons. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, that the who knows what the master plan was, if there was one, but certainly the market is greater than just orthodontists. So, you know, the business model has expanded. But, uh, yeah, I, I, we did a ton of, of Invisalign. I think Invisalign saved the orthodontists um, over the years. Um, the The adult population... I, you know how, how many heads, the back of heads I saw um, over the course of my career trying to talk adults into braces that came in wanting Invisalign? If you don't do Invisalign as an orthodontist, it's really, really tough to, to, to compete. And 20%, I'd say, is a low figure. I think it's, it's closer to 30%. And I think it's growing, Invisalign team. I think it's, it's really uh, the future. Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to be in the bracket business at this point. Really? So, um, have you met Joe Hogan? He's the, I, the CEO I have of the I, I actually went to lunch with Joe Hogan when, when he first took over the position, he came, uh, he came to New York and the reps took him out to some of the elite providers of which I was one and, uh, very, very bright, uh, interesting guy. What year was that? I don't know, two, three years ago, not that long. Two or three years ago? Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, he hasn't been uh, CEO that long. So he's, um, so what do you, what, so now uh, when you say, um, when they started Invisalign, they were only teaching to orthodontists um, in 1999. Now it looks like people are trying to bypass the orthodontists and do it mail order. Have you been aware of uh, some of these uh, companies? Are you kidding? Of course. I mean, uh, you know, I'm I'm in marketing. I have I have a pulse on what's going on, and we're here in New York. We we have the company called Smile Direct Club, which is the company that Invisalign purchased, I believe, around 17% of last year, and are producing aligners for that company. Not only bypassing orthodontists, they're bypassing dentistry completely. You don't need to have an exam. You don't need anything. Uh, in fact, in, in, in Manhattan, here in New York, we have uh, two uh, locations, one in Brooklyn and one in New York, that are, are, are manned by technicians in white coats, no dental training at all, where you could walk in off the street, get scanned, and fill out a, a, a credit card form and have your aligners, uh, if you're quote unquote approved, which I think everybody gets approved, uh, and you get your aligners and you're off and running. Well, I mean, you, you would think uh, uh, that would be channel conflict. If you're doing the majority of your sales through orthodontists and then you bypass them. I mean, an MBA school, uh, they would call that channel conflict. Is he getting any uh, pushback from doing that from his uh, existing customer Hell base? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you kidding me? But, you know, when you when – you, <laughs> You know, we, you know, orthodontists were really upset about it, and you know they were upset when when uh, when Invisalign decided to move into the general dental space. Okay, originally it was just specialist, and then moved into the general dental space, which is a, a much greater market, and now moving into this space as well. Um, yeah, orthodontists are real upset, but you know what? Orthodontists are dependent on Invisalign. There's not a lot an orthodontist can do about it. Um, you know, you can educate the public with regard to the do-it-yourself type of uh, of uh, companies like Smile Direct Club, but uh, you know, you, you you really can't do without Invisalign these days, in my opinion, and and have and have a vibrant, growing practice. So, what's their competitor then? Um, Clear Connect. Uh, uh, Clear, correct. I think. Uh, clear, clear, correct. You know, 
Yeah, there there are a few that have come and gone over the years. You know, patent uh, uh, fights and and legal battles, and I'm not sure when the when the patent expires. And, and but when it does, there'll be a lot more uh, companies coming into the field. Uh, but it it seems like plastic, uh, clear uh, liners are um, are are the growing area in orthodontics. When we first started, you talked about the. In- the amazing amount of debt these kids are walking out of. And one of the stressful things young orthodontists are facing when they open up their de novo office from scratch is, do you really need a CBCT? I mean, can they get by on a 20-year-old used Pano and Ceph, or do you think that the CBCT is a game changer and it's standard of care and they need to go drop another hundred grand on that? You know, if you get a hundred uh, orthodontists, you'll get... Uh... You know, uh, half and you get a hundred different opinions on that. I I was never a big uh, uh, radiation fan. You know, I mean, I I started my practice with uh, you know a a cone beam and a full mouth series, and it took me five years to be able to afford to buy a pan. Um, so I don't know where it's going. You know, it 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 seems like it's becoming so costly the overhead of getting going is is so costly that i i don't i don't know where it's going to come to an end and and incidentally this is this is the the uh fuel for the growth of the dso's in the corporate segment uh retail dentistry and retail orthodontics that's growing so quickly across the country there's a surplus of um of labor in the orthodontic market these days, and, and that's uh, with high debt. And the, there are great opportunities for young people to go into a different model than we did when we started our practice. I want to, I want to, um, this, this is a discussion that you have to be our age to remember, but um, it seems like, the, well, the, the first major DSO was um, the, um, um, the denture clinic. What, what's the name of that denture clinic? Uh, affordable dentures. Affordable dentures is a hundred year old uh, um, deal, and they kind of uh, really went into the underserved areas. Uh, den- all de- every dentist I know hates dentures. And another one was a uh, great uh, uh, Western Dental out in California. But but the only DSO that o- ever made it on the New York Stock Exchange was, of course, uh, Orthodontic Centers of America. And so many of these kids that are graduating school today. They were in grammar school when that was going on. They don't remember any of that. And it, it, um, it started, and uh, um, Lou, what was the guy's name? Uh, um, um, yeah, Lou, Lou something. But anyway. Uh, um, it went it, belly up. It, it, it spectacularly exploded on the, on the deal. What, what um, and, and, then, and then there was a dozen on NASDAQ, and there was Orthodox Centers of America, and it all imploded. And then a decade goes by. What's that? Yeah, Lazara, Gasper Lazara, good old boy from uh, Louisiana, but I think he moved out to Florida, and um, and then they're gone, and now they're back, and they've gone from like zero to twelve percent. But I, I I've noticed a couple of earthquakes in that industry that uh, no one's really talking about, and that is they only had really three major banks that were funding that, and East West Bank said no more. They 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 pulled out of funding DSOs, and they have a list of uh um DSOs that are. Uh, causing financial problems, and um, and then when you go in the DSOs, the dentist associate employee turnover is off the charts. I mean, they consider that if a dentist stays with them two years, that that's an A. Uh, if you go to any DSO convention, that's that's. I mean, how are you going to build a dental office brand? How are you going to keep the patients if you can't even keep the dentist? And I'm I'm wondering if you. What was your take on why Orthodontic Centers of America imploded? Because you lived through it. You were. You were in New York where it was publicly traded. <laughs> I, I was, and, and to, to be honest with you, I don't know that much about it and didn't pay that much about attention to it. But I'm paying attention to the DSOs now. And if you think these DSOs are going to implode, I think that uh, for, from what I'm reading, I don't see that. I, I see that this is the fastest growing segment in dentistry right now and growing in, in double digits. And the model is changed. And, and true, uh, they're not, uh, they may not keep people long term, keep their employees long term. But there, there, are, there are a few that are, are offering some really sweet deals to stay on. 
And there are a lot of young people that are looking at these opportunities of not having to be an IT guy, not having to be a, a, um, you know, an inventory manager, not having to worry about staff, uh, being able to leave at five o'clock and having a vacation time and insurance paid for is not a bad deal. And, and I think that what's, what's happening now is we're seeing a, a split in, in the way to make money in dentistry. And the, the, it's going to break, it's breaking down into two segments, groups that are uh, doing high volume. There's certainly ways of making money doing high volume uh, and low fees. Uh, and, and, and they've been around a long time and, and that's one model. But there's also uh, opportunities here. And those opportunities are for those private practices that are able to communicate their value to their patients that they're worth a little bit extra and they provide extra. And if they could demonstrate that, and that's part of what we do in, our, in, in marketing uh, our practices, is we try to position our practices on value, not on fees. Because as you know, what's happening now is we're having a commoditization of our services. We're, we're having insurance companies, we're having DSOs, uh, we're having a, a, a plethora of uh, messages that are being sent to our potential new patients that are telling them that uh, a crown's a crown's a crown, an implant's an implant's an implant, braces are braces are braces. And it doesn't matter where you go, all that matters is how much it cost. And um, those practices that are able to provide extra, there is a, a good segment of the population that would look for that and willing to pay a little more if they knew they existed. And there are a lot of great practices out there, but if you're not able to communicate it effectively, and social media is a great way to do that, if you're not able to do that, then new perspective, new patients have nothing to go on other than cost. If they believe that your services are a commodity, then they're going on cost. And we can't, private practices, traditional private practices can't compete at that level. So I'm seeing a, a shakeup in terms of uh, the dental industry right now. And uh, the concern is the people in the middle, the people that are charging more but aren't demonstrating more value. And they're going to lose market share to the low end. But the high end, as long as they can uh, demonstrate and communicate uh, an enhanced level of value, people will be willing to pay. They have always have been and they always will be uh, to pay a little extra for that. To me, the clear advantage of corporate is the fact that, you know, I've, I've been in dentist for 30 years. It, it's, it's harder than hell just to stay up on fillings and crowns and root canals and what have you, but how do you, but now with corporate, you got to compete at their level on marketing, call centers, IT, HR, accounting and financing, buying clubs for lab and supplies. Um, you're a marketing expert. Who do you think does a better job of marketing in general, corporate dentistry or the solo practice? You know, I, I, most solo practices don't do any marketing at all or limited marketing. Um, the, the DSOs in corporate dentistry, they're masters in marketing, but what are they marketing? They're marketing low affordable fees. That's what they're marketing. And, uh, people are attracted to that and people will gravitate to that if they believe that they're going to get the same quality as they're getting in your practice. And that's the challenge. And, and for those private practices that are marketing effectively, uh, those practices are growing in double digits. They stay, it's easier to stand out now than there was years ago. It's easier now than it was years ago if you use the right tools to do so and, 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 and communicate properly. That's the key. Well, you know, everybody that I know in dentistry for 30 years of studies marketing says that the United States dental market is about 50-50, 50, 50, 50 shop on price, 50 shop on value. And you look at uh, all the DSOs, you're right, they're all marketing and taking a strategy of high volume, low fees, volume. But uh, you look at healthcare, like I'm out here in Phoenix and we, we have a branch of the Mayo Clinic and um, people come from all over the world, the Mayo Clinic, um, the Cleveland Clinic, 
uh, scripts out in San Diego, uh, the Houston Center. You're out there in New York, the Sloan Teetering. It's like, I haven't seen any DSO that's taking the strategy. Hey, we're the Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we're, we're, we're all about quality. And, and half of America um, does not want to pick a doctor off their list. Half of America is very particular, especially dentistry, because it's all surgery. You're, you're, it's all the doctor is working with his hands in your mouth. Um, it's not like a physician where, um, you know, most of the time they're just talking to you and writing prescriptions. Uh, so if half of America is that value shopper, um, how how do you say it's easier for that value orthodontist or dentist to stand out today than it was 30 years ago? Because we have great tools now that we didn't have 30 years ago. We have the ability now to utilize our own patients to do the advertising for you. That's that that's the focus of what we do, people in practice. We use your patients to do the advertising for you. Years ago, when one of your patients would recommend another one of your patients, you'd get one patient for one. And that was great. That's how we built our practices. You and I built our practices based on one family at a time, one recommending to another. Now we have the opportunity to, by utilizing reviews, by utilizing social engagement on Facebook, by utilizing Facebook advertising, we have the ability to have our patients now, instead of referring one person to you, refer hundreds of people to you, get that message out in a, in a viral way. We didn't have that before, but we have that now. And, and those practices that are effectively using those tools are growing just because of what you just said. Half the population is looking for that. The problem is that most, and I will tell you, most dental practices do not use the tools and don't communicate it. And as a result, patients are confused. They're confused and they're not sure they're getting more where they are than they would be at a low fee DSO and they're losing market share. That's the problem. So um, how do my homies listen to you right now? Okay, so if they go to your website, it is PPL practice, which stands for uh, people and practice, right? People is yep, PPL yep, practice. Yep. So people, PPL practice.com. Uh, if they go to your website right now, um, how are you, what, what are they going to find and how do they learn how to leverage their clients um, for word of mouth referral? Easy. Uh, and and it, there, are, there are three primary uh, strategies that an effective marketing campaign should have. Number one, and most importantly, you need Google public reviews. Not one, not two, dozens. We, we have our practices getting 40, 50, 60 positive five-star Google reviews. Why public reviews? Because when somebody does a Google ser a search on Google, that's what they see right next to your practice with those stars. Um, so it's important to get those. A lot of practices are getting reviews on a variety of their um, uh, management page sites that are not public reviews. They're reviews, but they're housed on their website. Those are no good. I mean, they're, they're fine, but nobody sees those. You need Google positive reviews. So that's the baseline. We have an iPad system and a, and a variety of different ways that we can leverage current patients to, to leave five-star reviews while monitoring any negative comments at the same time. So online reputation is critical. It's arguably your most, most significant asset is your reputation. You have to protect it. And if you don't have positive reviews, you're vulnerable to one or two people you and I have been around long enough to know that there's a certain percentage of patients that walk in our door that are going to be a little bit off center. And if they decide that it's their job to trash you online and they go public and you don't have a lot of positive reviews, that's a, that's a tremendous negative impact on your reputation. When a new patient, prospective new patient goes, looks and sees a negative review and no positive reviews, no good. So reviews, number one. Number two, social engagement. 
Having a Facebook page is not enough. A business Facebook page is not enough. Having a website is not enough. You need to engage your patients online. You need to walk them online. You need to incentivize them and to share your practice brand on their website, on their Facebook page, where they have two, three, four, five hundred of their friends, uh, prospective new patients there. And third, uh, you need to reach people in your geographic location that don't know you exist with some content to show that you're an expert in something. Um, you know, in real estate, we used to say location, location, location. In marketing, what we say is differentiate, differentiate, differentiate. You have to stand out from the crowd. And each of us has some unique qualities that we're good at. Some customer service, some are our clinical expertise, multidisciplinary care, um, uh, Invisalign. There's something that we're really good at, and we need to communicate that difference to the public. So that's what they'll learn. Now, what percent of your clients are orthodontists versus general dentist? Uh, Majority are orthodontists. Have you you read an article uh, for Orthotown on this? Uh, I have. Orthotown It was published. Yeah, 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 I have. Nice. See, I I own Orthotown, but I'm not allowed to go on the site because I'm not an orthodontist. I I, I kid you not. I Uh, I will send you. I will will send you a copy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. E- e- email me a copy. Um, and, and I'll write another one. I'll write another one. Yeah. Um, how long ago um, was was that? Uh, probably a year ago, maybe, or maybe two years ago. So so what um, I know we have a lot of orthodontists uh, listening right now. Uh, get a lot of because uh, um, these podcasts are listed on Orthotown, too. Um, so what are you doing for orthodontist? We're doing just what I just described. I mean, you could do all of this yourself. But it, it's beyond the scope of what you can do these days. Years ago, as an orthodontist, I used to make my own retainers because I was sitting there doing nothing. So why would I spend money on a lab to make my retainers? There came a point where it was more productive to me for me to be at the chair and to send out to, to have retainers. That's where marketing is right now. It, it, and it, it's become um, uh, it, we, our cottage industry has, has, has evolved now to the point where you, it, the do-it-yourself stuff is very difficult to do and time-consuming to do and requires some expertise. Just Facebook advertising itself. You know, when we run a Facebook ad for, a, for an ortho practice or a dental practice, we'll, we'll run four or five different ones. We'll change the graphics on a couple. We'll change the words on others. We'll run them all simultaneously and we'll A-B test them all see which one gets the traction, then we'll pull the budget from the ones that aren't doing well and put the rest behind the others so we get the pay-per-click down. You know, in Facebook uh, advertising, we can get the pay-per-click down to 50 50 cents or less for a warm lead. Uh, You can't do that with Google advertising. So Facebook opens some some great opportunities, but it's become big league now. It's It's not the way it used to be. That is amazing. I think what you said is profound. In the in the old day, you make someone happy, and they would tell their friend. But now, with uh, I was on Facebook, the average American on Facebook has three hundred and fifty Facebook friends. Um, um, younger users, okay. So here's what it says: it says the average Facebook user now has about three hundred thirty friends, though the median number is quite a bit lower at two hundred. This means that while half of all Facebook users have two hundred or fewer friends, many of the Facebook users have quite a few more. The average American has 350 Facebook friends. Unsurprisingly, younger users generally have more connections. Those aged between 18 to 24 are the friendliest group when it comes to Facebook with an average of 649 friends. But my question to you is, when you're running Facebook ads, who are you targeting? Are you targeting the moms bringing in uh, 12-year-old children? Or are you, who, who, are you, who are you targeting with Facebook? I mean, do... Do little kids in high school uh, go on Facebook and go home and tell their mom, I want to go to Dr. Good? Uh, to a limited extent. The target are the moms. Mom, moms make the decisions. The, the, you know, the, the, most of the kids are already off Facebook. You know, they're, they, the, they were on Facebook before we got on Facebook. And we're on Facebook now. They don't want to be on Facebook. They, they have their own different venues, and, and, and they come and they go. But the moms are on Facebook, and that's where your practice needs to be. 
You know, if your practice is not active on Facebook, you are missing the biggest opportunity there is. What, what you said is, is right on. You had three or four hundred pe- people connected to each one of those moms, for example. But guess what? They're not branding your practice on their page for nothing. They don't just say, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to share. I'm going to comment. I'm not. I, they don't do that. You need to hold out a carrot. You need to have some sort of incentive for them to do that. Uh, one, of the, one of the key uh, features that we do is we, we set up a, a sweepstakes on a practice. And when a patient enters it on Facebook, they're given three additional chances to win if they click that share button. And that's that share button is where the value is. It's not preaching to the choir. This is another common mistake that, uh, that dentists make is that they get a big group on Facebook and they're promoting to them, um, but they're missing the biggest opportunity, which are their friends and that the exponential value of doing that. That's where the new patients come from. That's why a lot of, a lot of uh, dentists north and on say that social media doesn't work. We have, we have a Facebook page and we have you know, 2,000, 3,000 people, but I'm not getting any new patients. Duh. That's right. Why would you? Unless, there's a, unless you get them to like, share, comment. It, what's missing on most dental Facebook pages are the social in the social media. Social is the key factor. You need to get likes, shares, and comments. And we find typically uh, uh, patients don't do that automatically. They need to have a carrot. They need to have a prize. They need to have some chance to win something in order to to give them the incentive in order to do so so that's what we do and what are what are the what are the hottest prizes oh man we we have uh you know know, we have probably about uh 70 uh offices across the u.s and canada that we represent and the the prizes vary Uh, right now there's one practice uh uh, running a, a disney cruise for the family uh, we have another one that did um, a Bermuda cruise. Uh, we have some that do uh, local getaways for the weekend, family getaways. Um, so, you know, it needs to be significant. It can't be, you know, the typical uh, movie tickets or uh, dinner for two. Uh, in my practice, uh, we ran a um, a, 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 a a uh, Broadway show, two tickets to a Broadway show, dinner for two, hotel overnight, and a limo back and forth. And you know what? What was the biggest draw out of that prize that people were most excited about? What? Broadway tickets, do you think? No. Dinner for two? No. How about overnight stay in a nice hotel? No. The limo. They like the limo. They like Getting picked up in a limo, driven into Manhattan, not have to worry about their car, not have to worry about it, traffic, things like that. Anyway, you put up a big prize like that, you get a lot of attention. You get a, you get, you get um, a big bang for your buck. I have a, a dentist friend out here in Phoenix, and there's, it's, you can't really park in some of these uh, good restaurant areas in Scottsdale or Mill Avenue in Tempe. And he driverless cars to the restaurant. There's no parking. So he has his driverless car drive around while he's in there eating. And then he comes back and uh, gets a driverless ride home. I, I also th- see that phenomenon in the, uh, um, the the lottery. Like, you know, most all Americans, a million dollars would be a game changer. But uh, winning a million dollars doesn't draw them out. But once it gets over like a hundred million dollars, uh, they, they, they all go crazy. And uh, it's like, um, I, I never understood that phenomenon. Why? Uh, why? And, and, you know, you take you take a prize like a, a cruise, you know, uh, the uh, Disney cruise for an ortho practice. That's a great that's a great prize. Right. That that's something. And but we, we figure out the value of it. And it, it, it's around maybe three grand or so. Um, and the, the and a lot of orthodontists and dentists would look at that and say, hey, I, I can't pay that. That's so expensive. And meanwhile, you run this contest over six months or nine months. Um, it's tax deductible. If you get one new patient out of it, it pays for the whole thing. But, you know, 
a lot of a lot of my colleagues think small. And, 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 you know, when, when it comes to overhead, you know what the best way to lower your overhead is? Increase your production. Increase your production. It's not getting cheaper gloves. Right. It's increasing production. That's the best way to lower your overhead. And what do you think the average new patient is worth in an orthodontist office these days for your 70 clients spread out over America? Well, I mean, it's worth, it's certainly worth, uh, uh, you know, it, more than just one case. Oftentimes, you know, but, an but average what, orthodontist. Go ahead. But, but what, 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 what is the average fee for records, models, and, and an ortho? You, I'd what, say, you know, it varies in different parts of the country, but I'd say somewhere between maybe five and five thousand and six thousand is probably uh, the average. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, the orthodontist and the general dentist have the same value of a new patient, but the orthodontist captures it in 24 months. Yeah, I, I see it between 5,000 and 6,500, depending on if you're in Manhattan or Kansas. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And the general dentist will do the same amount, but captured over 60 months, five years. Uh, so mm -hmm. when you look at the fact that if you, if you did this and you got one new patient, that's five to six grand off one and, new patient. And, and oftentimes you get a family member, you get a friend or a neighbor, um, I mean, that, that's how we built our practices in, in the past. One at a time by, that's the best referral there is. When you have a patient branding your office for you, that's a, that's a, a, a statement of validation. So, um, that's the key. The key is getting your patients to brand your practice for you through reviews, through posting on their Facebook page, um, that's been the key in the past, and that's the key now. The only difference, and you ask what's different now, the technology's different. It's a, it's a great time to be marketing right now. And what do you think a, an orthodontist um, should be spending on marketing? Uh, what percent of revenue collected dollars do you think should be spent on marketing? Well, I, I, I can tell you that um, you know, if you look at what, what the industry averages are in other um, – in other industries other than dentistry, it's usually four to 5% of their production, which is a big number. In dentistry, it, we, we don't spend nearly enough on marketing our practices. But I would say that uh, probably around two grand a month, you should be able to do everything that we've talked about, including uh, a, a healthy budget to uh, Facebook for advertising. So a lot of a lot of people confuse the terms marketing, advertising. Uh, advertising is just one component or subset of marketing. Other forms of marketing, I mean, marketing includes public relations, media planning, product pricing and distribution, sales strategy, customer support, market research, community involvement. Um, do you mostly uh, in your uh, business are you mostly um, social media on Facebook, or do you do other forms of marketing? Well, you know. We're not re we're, we're a marketing consultancy. You know, we, we consult and we look at each individual practice to see what their needs are and, and where, where they need supplementation. Some of it we do ourselves. Some of it we'll refer out. So what we want to do is we want to fill the holes and we want to cover all of the bases. There's so many touch points that new patients come to new practices um, uh, from that we need to cover them all. So you, you need to have a good website. We don't do websites, but if a practice needs a website, then we need to find uh, somebody to, to replace their website. They need to show up on page one. Uh, that's called SEO, as you know. If they don't show up on page one, and then we need to get some SEO money there. We don't do SEO, but we'll, we'll, we'll work with you to find somebody that does. So my job is to find out what the problem is, diagnose the problem, come up with a treatment plan. Uh, some, of the, some of the treatment plan we could provide, most of the time we can provide all of it, but if we need supplementation, then we need to, we need to reach out. Um, but you know what? None of anything that you do from a marketing standpoint will be effective at all if you don't provide high quality care and treat your patients well. You can't keep people waiting 45 minutes or an hour or an hour and a half 
and then uh, expect to get really good reviews and, and, and get people referring to your practice. So part of what we do is seeing what's going on and cleaning up that. Sometimes it's a matter of how they're scheduling. Uh, other times, um, it's not a marketing issue at all when we find a practice that's not growing. They're getting plenty of new patients. They're not converting them. Patients aren't accepting their treatment plan. So what good is spending a lot of money bringing new patients to the door if they're going out the other door? So we need to talk about affordability. We need to talk about communication. That's all part of the consultancy that we do. So everybody listening right now is um, probably 85% are commuting to work. Uh, They have an hour commute. That's why the show is an hour. Um, So they can't take notes. So what I do is if they follow me on Twitter, at Howard Fran, I just retweeted couple of your last tweets you're at people underscore practice at people underscore practice it's got a link to his uh website pplpractice.com um what if what if an orthodontist is listening to this and just wants to talk to you how or, or, or because here's i know my home he's they always have a unique situation he's like like when you're lecturing is there any questions no and then you break and everybody runs up to you and asks you a question because they always think they always think they have a unique problem and it's always the exact same problem as everybody else has in the room um how if they, if they want to talk to you um what, what does it cost uh to talk to you or any of that stuff it doesn't cost anything to talk to me uh, i'll do a, a, an evaluation and and diagnose and provide a treatment plan for them at at no fee they could call me 888-866-DOCS that's our phone number nice they, they could email me, leon at pplpractice.com. Either so, way. So who's the those, most famous Leon? Who's the most famous Leon? Gee, yeah. that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Right now, it's uh, I'm on your show. It's Leon Klempner. Because I'm trying. There, there, wasn't there a famous <laughs> Leon? Was it a, was it a Disney character or something back in the day? Uh, could be, I, you know what, they're, the Leons are rare. You don't find that many Leons around. Um, have you ever thought of changing your name to Lion? Uh, when Change I go to, you know, to I. Yeah, you know, I do a lot of volunteer work with Operation Smile and Smile Train. I, I'm a big cleft palate volunteer. And when I'm in South America, you know what my name is? Lion. They can't say Leon. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, I have trouble saying Leon. So it, it, it comes out lion, and uh, so I'm lion. So speaking of marketing and lions, don't you think the greatest marketing campaign ever done was when that Dr. Palmer went and shot Cecil the lion? I mean. Uh, what a boost for dentistry, huh? My <laughs> God, I think he got more hits than any of your clients got on any of their websites. How, how many uh, hits do you think he got on his website? Uh, I, you know what? I, 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 I'm surprised he didn't get any hits, uh, you know, directly to him and not, uh, not on his website. It was really, that was like, that was a set. That's a, that was a, one of the saddest moments to see that he was a dentist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, um, I, I, I still always say that I, I tell these young kids when they come out of school, I said, you know, if I had to bet on two doctors, the one I would bet on is always the one with the best chair side manner. I mean, because uh, because you said it before. I mean, these dentists, they, they don't realize that, um, you know, they, they don't know the conversion. They don't realize that a lot of them, 10 people have to visit your website before one calls. They don't realize that three people have to call before one comes in. They don't realize that. Um, three people need to have a cavity before you convert one to a filling. So if you work that funnel back up to have one filling, you need three patients. To get three patients, you need nine people uh, to call. To have nine people to call, you need 90 people to hit the website. And then they say the problem is Trump and Putin and North Korea and the economy. And it's like, really? Don't you think the problem is the man in the mirror? And when you look at that converting of three calls to get one in, that's having a receptionist who has the most amazing um, chemistry, karma, you know, just an adorable person who, and who has time instead of saying, can you please hold? But, you know, I, I always see the, um, it's funny how dentists and orthodontists call that lady up there front desk. They name her after a piece of furniture. But if you go into the S&P 500, that's incoming sales. That's, it's incoming marketing. And those people 
have training and that they have a, a leader that pumps everybody in the call center up and gets them fired up. And when they convert someone to come in, we'll go over there and give them a flower or a cookie or a rose or, and, and, and the dentist, the orthodontist, I mean, my God, I mean, no offense. I know you're not us, but they, they think it's all about them that they, they walk on water and you build it, they will come. And they're just all that in a bag of chips. They have no idea that their website sucks. If 10 people go to it, but only one calls that your front desk lady is overburdened and half of these incoming calls are going to voicemail or they're told, please hold. And man, if they could just uh, get an amazing chairside manner and fill that office with people who just have outgoing, amazing chemistry and karma, then, um, and, and, and then, but I, I want to start all the way at the beginning. You know, anytime a dentist emails me, you know, like like your email, Leon, just think of Lion. I was trying to get a, uh, an image so they'd remember while they're driving. So you're Leon the Lion at pplpractice.com. Um, if you, when these dentists send me an email like Leon at pplpractice.com, I just knock off the Leon ad, go www, because I want to see who I'm talking to. You know, you get these emails. I mean, my God, the average website looks like they went to the Chicago Midwinter meeting 10 years ago and bought some website in a box um the, the it's a lot of them don't even have a picture of them they have a a stock photo i mean how butt ugly are you that you have a stock photo um you don't you don't even know who the people are um i like your website because as a video i mean i got to meet you i got to feel you your chemistry your karma i i started liking you you know 20 seconds in that video i mean you're just uh and so their website, I, I, I would just say the average dentist, what we'll all ask you, what percent of orthodontist websites would you give an A or a B or a C or a D or an F? Well, I, you know, I, I have to say that um, orthodontists are stepping up and, 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 and sites are getting better. But um, so, you know, A, B, C, I don't know. They're, they're getting better. But what's missing from the website is the relationship of the website to their message. What's their distinctive message? What's their differentiator? What are they really good at? What do they represent? And, you know, and, and, and their website should be a visual representation of that, not pretty colors. You know, pretty colors are better than what it used to be, which were ugly colors, uh, but it's still not where, where it should be. And just to, to, to kind of tie this back to the DSO discussion that we're having before, those practices, those dental practices um, that, that aren't paying attention to their, their image and how they're treating people are the ones that are going to lose to the DSOs. People aren't going to put up with paying extra money for that because they're not going to see any value in paying extra for that then they would go in some place where they can get it cheaper. They know it's a they, that they know it's a volume. They know they know all that stuff. But if they see that the dental practice that they're going to is plain vanilla, average, nothing special, then it's a commodity. Yeah, you, you're probably a good dentist, but they're probably a good dentist there too. They're licensed. You're licensed. What's the difference? I might as well go with the cheaper one. And that's what's starting to happen now. And that's why I say we're going to divide up into two tiers. They're going to be the ones that are going to prosper because there's a big percentage of the population. You said 50. I'm not so sure, but I'll take it if that's the case, that are looking for value and willing to pay a little extra for value, but only if they could identify it. And how do they identify it? Well, look at your website initially, right? How else? What other tools do they have to evaluate it? So it's the website, it's the personality, it's who picks up the phone and how, how they respond. I've heard you, and, and let me give you the compliment I was going to tell you, I was going to give you the compliment early on before we got on the phone, okay? Because <laughs> you, you, yeah. you I, said, I, I hope. I said, if you're going to give me a compliment, we got to get it on the air. Let's start taping. <laughs> exactly. So, so uh, I'm going to give it to you now. I sat in on a staff lecture about, I don't know, it could have been 10 years ago for all I know, where you gave the lecture to the staff. And, and you said, 
what's your job at the, uh, uh, when you answer the phone for a new patient? What is it? What's most important? What is it? What do you have to do? What's your job? What's your job? Be nice. Tell them about the practice. No. no. And you know, you're not like, you know, uh, how, would, how would I say subtle? <laughs> that wouldn't be a way to describe you, at least in the lecture room that I saw. You were like ripping into these people and you said, your job is to get the appointment. Get the appointment. That's your job. I, I probably get, said, get their ass scheduled in a chair. I need butts in a seat. Well, I, that's probably what. <laughs> that's probably what you said. But but there was a lot to it, and 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 that's one thing I want to compliment you on. And the other thing I want to compliment you on is being a. I practiced solo for half my career, and then I brought in an associate, and then I had a partner, opened up another office. But half of my career I was by myself. And when you're by yourself in dentistry, you're isolated. And, and it could be really tough. Not only uh, clinical decisions, but staff decisions, whole host of things you gotta figure out by yourself. What you've done, probably more than anybody else, is you've created communities that have allowed dentists to not be alone, even if they practice alone. And I've been on the sites, and I have uh, go ahead. You know, I have uh, uh, posted on, on different cases that I see, and I've given my opinion, et cetera. And you do that from home without traveling, and I think that's big. And I don't know if you get enough credit for that. Thanks, and uh, yeah, I, I was uh, that that was cool. Uh, we started that in nine. We we beat Facebook by six years, and uh, the whole deal was with Dental Town. No dentist would ever have to practice solo again, and it meant a lot to me. I wanted it for myself so bad. I used to put the kids to bed and uh, for my four boys and be eight thirty, and I'd sit there in that chair, and I just have knots in my stomach thinking about. Did I mess up this root canal? Should I have done this? Should I done all I wanted to do was talk to another homie and say what you know? What do you think? That just uh, to me it was priceless. Um, and uh, but yeah. Um, so I, I want to ask you some uh, mundane questions. Um, a lot, lot of uh, if you go to Dental Town, you go to one of the fifty categories marketing under marketing. You go to social media. One of the questions they ask is uh, on Facebook. You can if you make a post, you can boost it. Or another way to do it is create an ad. Is is that two is that two roads going to the same place, or is that two different things? What what's the difference between boosting a post and creating an ad? Yeah, they, they're two different things, and and uh, depending on how you utilize them, boosting a post is when you take something a post that 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 you have on your Facebook page. And you put some money behind it so you could reach more people with that similar, with that same post. So a, a lot of your listeners may not be aware that the people that they have connected to them, their fans on Facebook. Is that what they're called, fans? Yeah, oh, they're, fr they're fans, they're followers. They, they, it, dentists accumulate a lot of followers on their, on their Facebook page but only a fraction of them actually see their posts. See, Facebook throttles down the number of people that see your given posts. They claim it's because they don't want to bombard people with too much information. The reality is they're looking to monetize it. So now if, if me as an orthodontist wants to reach my 2000, I got to cough up some money. Otherwise, every post I make is going to reach maybe 5% of that 2000. So it's, it's, so boosting is one mechanism that I could reach all 2000 or maybe even extend beyond the 2000, beyond the people. I could reach some of the friends of them by boosting, but it's just boosting that particular post. Facebook advertising is, is different. With Facebook advertising, we can create uh, an ad that um, when a prospective target clicks on it, we could take them directly to content on the dentist's website itself. So we can bring them from Facebook to the website. That's a big advantage. Um, people that, that are looking for content um, are qualifying, self-qualifying themselves when they click on it. An example would be, you know, um, five ways to get your teeth straight you know, quickly or, um, 
you know, uh, how to how to get a, a beautiful smile in one visit, let's say. And they would click on it and it would take them to content on the blog of the dentist site where he will have authored an article on laminates, for example, or Invisalign, thereby creating an expert um, perspective um, from the patient's uh, angle. So now the patient's on the Facebook, on, on the website, off of Facebook, and when they're on the website, they'll look at reviews, they'll look at the doctor's credentials, they'll mosey around, and you're more likely to get the call. So there's a difference between the two, and you could use the two in conjunction with one another, but they're not the same. I have another technical question on a Facebook post. Um, whenever you uh, make a Facebook uh, boost a post or create an ad, it always has a little checkbox. Do you want this to go to Instagram too? Uh, Facebook bought Instagram for a billion bucks. First of all, what are your thoughts on Instagram? Is Are moms on Instagram? Because you said you wanted to target the moms. Yeah. Um, so, so tell me what your thoughts are on Instagram. And if you're creating an ad or boosting a post, should you check the box to include Instagram? Yeah, it, it all depends. The, 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 to answer your question, yes, moms are on Instagram, but they're on Instagram looking at photos. Instagram's a visual medium. It's photographs. Kind of like um, Pinterest? Uh, kind of like Pinterest. Um, it doesn't translate well to much of the content that we're looking to deliver. Every once in a while, for example, we had a practice um, that uh, was giving away tickets to um, a, a popular um, singer, Bruno Mars, um, Who much in demand. Who is the heir apparent of Michael Jackson. Well, I mean, the, he's some hot serious stuff. music critics who says that's the next Michael Jackson. Okay, well, you can imagine that this type of prize has an appeal both to parents and to kids. And um, that's a good one to air on Instagram because there, there, there is a, a cross a section of uh, attention that could be brought to that. But generally speaking, the, 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 the leverage should be on Facebook itself. That's where uh, you'll get the most bang for your dollar. Okay, so the I think you just answered... Through- I think you yeah, just answered my follow-up question because um, um, a lot of people also ask what, on their social media, should, is is Facebook 80% of it and do you really need to do the Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Google Plus, and whatever the hell Snapchat is? By the way, what, what the hell is Snapchat and why did Facebook only have to pay a billion for Instagram but Snapchat did an IPO for $27 billion. That almost makes me want to log on to Snapchat to see the hell it is are you have you done that i have done that i'm not a a a big fan of snapchat it's like a visual you take again it's a a photographic uh, um, medium where you take a picture and then it disappears after a period of time um again so you're saying anthony weiner should have switched from twitter to snapchat (laughs) is that was that your advice well that would have been that that might have been a smart move Anthony, that might you need to get off move. Twitter. I think Trump and, and Anthony Weiner both need to get off Twitter and go to go to Snapchat. But here, but to answer your question more fully, there is an advantage of fully setting up all of those sites for your practice. Why? Because they show up in searches. They show up in searches. They're free websites. They're free websites. There's no reason not to claim them and to populate them with your website, your your telephone number. Uh, some photographs, some information about your practice. Why not? They're free. And if and, 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 a, and in a Google search, they occasionally show up. Not all the time, but why not? Why not take advantage of what's there? I know uh, um, 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 what you also do. We, we just put on uh, the uh, share buttons on Orthotown Magazine articles and Dental Town Magazine articles. When you read an article... I was telling my homies, I said, look, these people all write the articles for free. A lot of these dentists, they spend months writing that little 1,600-word article in the charts and graphs. And if you read it, the greatest compliment you can do is just reach up there and you can share it to your social media. You can share it to Facebook, LinkedIn, Pinterest, uh, all that stuff. You should go into Orthotown, since I can't, go to your article and share that to your social media. And then I'll retweet. Then I can can share it to uh, uh, my Twitter followers and all that. You know what? A lot of what we talked about, I'll put that in an article and I'll get a new article up there. 
a more a little bit more contemporary and then um and then we could put it everywhere right on well um i just want to say that um do you actually live where, where, where do you live i live on long island it, it's so funny because new york city doesn't exist uh, if you go to New York City, and no one says they live in New York City. They say, I live in Manhattan, I live in the Bronx, I live in Brooklyn, and you live in Long Island? On Long Island. So that's not even <laughs> part of New York City, is it? It's a suburb of New York City. Yeah, it's not one of the five boroughs? Right. So New York boroughs. City is basically a conspiracy that doesn't exist. They say it's the largest city in, in America, uh, but uh, it doesn't exist. But uh, I just want to say that I'll never get my first lecture I ever gave in my life was August 4th, 1990 in New York City, and I was a little nervous, so I called my classmate Craig Steichen that I went to UMKC with. I was in Phoenix, he's in Albuquerque. We flew down there together, we're talking, you know, I'm sitting on the window seat, we're talking, and all of a sudden I glanced out and I saw that skyline. I'll never forget it in my life. It was like seeing a UFO. I grew up in Kansas, where the tallest thing is a grain silo, and I swear to God, I think that is the coolest city in the world, the most bizarre statistic I ever read in my life, was that if all seven and a half billion humans lived at the density of Manhattan, we'd all fit on New Zealand. Wow. But uh, I just, uh, I swear to God. Uh, so no, I just want one well, off the I'd, wall. I'd love to uh, take you out to dinner and uh, if you spend some time in New York, I'd love to uh, show you around. What I, what I want you to hook me up with is uh, I don't need a drug dealer or anything like that, but I, I need some illegal guy that can give you a Broadway ticket. Every time I go to Broadway, every time I want to go to the show I want, the lady looks at me like, where are you from, Kansas? That show was sold out for six months. I remember when I tried to, I, it seems like every show I want to see, there's no way to get a ticket. I'm like, okay, they're selling drugs on the street. There's got to be some guy selling Broadway tickets uh, next you, to the, you know what? the drug dealer you, stand. You send me a, a few of the Broadway shows that you want to see that are tough to get tickets, and I'll get you tickets. That, 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 that's just, I, I think it's the most amazing place in the world. Uh, I don't know if I'd want to live there in February. I kind of like Phoenix more in February. By the way, I, I, here's another bizarre thing about New York I don't understand. Um, when they move the Phoenix from all around the country, they go to Phoenix and Glendale and Chandler and Mesa and all that stuff. But the New Yorkers only go to Scottsdale. <laughs> and, and I don't know what it is. I mean, because Scottsdale doesn't look anything like Manhattan. But a New Yorker, when they come to when they come to the valley, they're only gonna go to Scottsdale. They're only gonna stay in Scottsdale. If they buy a house, it'll only be in Scottsdale. <laughs> and they could they could get the same house for half the price in Chandler or Glendale, and they they won't even consider. So what what is the New York hang up with uh, Scottsdale? We don't know any better. That's all. We're we're ignorant. That's 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 the bottom line. That's you know, we, line. we don't know. We don't know what we're doing. All right, well, it's Leon Klempner, 888-866-DOCS. Love the phone number. That's so cool that you got DOCS, D-O-C-S. Now I'm going to dial my uh, my area code and uh, uh, prefix a DOCS, see who answers the phone. 888-866-DOCS. You can email him, Leon, at pplpractice.com. And then we're going to show you the video that I watched on your website, which made me reach out to call you to get you on the show. And the only last thing I'm going to say is, my God, when you get to work, please remember that more traffic's on the smartphone than the, than, the, than the computer now. You open up your website on your smartphone. A lot of you guys don't even do the basics where, what's that technology called where they right-size the website to your smartphone Re phone screen? Responsive. Responsive. Yeah. I mean, I mean, 90% of the dentists I go to, on they don't even have a responsive site. You're sitting there with your fingers and thumbs trying to pull their website again. And then, their, and then their picture looks like it was a mugshot for being arrested for a DUI. I don't, and, and some of these guys are my friends that I know. They're lovable, adoring people, but the mugshot looks like they're watching you know, their mother get mauled by a hyena, um, where if it was a YouTube video, their energy and karma would come through, and they should film it uh, when they have their loved ones on the other side. You know how you try to get a baby to, to look for the picture? You need to be in a room where whoever loves you is getting pulling the best out of you and energy. Look at your website because I'll tell you what, forget marketing. I mean, if, if 10 people go to your site and only one converts to call, I mean, fix that problem first. And uh, I, I don't and, and I know it's tough because I'm a dentist. I mean, I mean, if I had to pick between taking a social media class or doing a greater root canal, I mean, I mean, 
root canals are more fun than golf. I mean, who wants to learn accounting and finance and SEO and website? You didn't go to school eight years because you want to be a social media expert. You went to school eight years because you want the worst toothache in the world to walk in your office and you want to fix it like a fireman. I mean, a fireman only wants a five alarm fire. He doesn't want some smoldering trailer. He wants a fire. And uh, I want a toothache. That's why I named my dental office today's dental. I want to see it today, right now. You got a toothache, walk in. We're in an emergency room. We're ready for you. So if that's not your passion, you're never going to get good at it. Dentists only get good at what they're interested in, what they're passionate about. So if marketing and advertising and SEO and website responsiveness and all this stuff, if that's not your passion, you're never going to be good at it. So that's why there's guys like Leon Klempner who will do it for you. Leon, thank you so much for coming on my show today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. All right, buddy. And next time I see you, I hope we're going to dinner in Manhattan on the way to a Broadway play. Sounds good to me. All right, buddy. Go have on. a rocking hot day. By far, the fastest growing segment in dentistry is large group corporate practices. They're really very profitable. They're fueled by deep pocket venture capital dollars. And unfortunately, they have very low fees and they're coming your way. What's their marketing strategy? Very simple. They want to educate people in your community to believe that every procedure that you do is a commodity. They're spending millions of dollars sending the message to your perspective and your current patients that braces are braces or an implant is an implant. If they're successful, your potential patients will come to believe that the only difference between your practice and their practice are cost and convenience. And I can tell you that is an unwinnable position for you. If you believe that low cost alternatives will continue to increase and you'll continue to face downward pressure on your fees, then one, you need to take some action now so that we can begin educating your potential patients that there is a difference. Or two, your practice will continue to lose market share. I've embedded a link to my personal calendar below. Click on it. Let's find a time for us to talk. I believe I can help you.